It's a great, great, great honor and pleasure for me to be in this conference. And uh, thank you, uh, Holiday and Bolivia for uh, inviting me for this. And then thank you all of you uh, in, uh, uh, for your attendance. So I just, uh, uh, yesterday somebody, one of the speaker mentioned there is no silver bullet here. So I just wanted to start uh, with that actually. It appears there is a silver bullet in the treatment of uh, uh, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome or a chronic Lyme, whatever you wanted to call it. Pain is real, that's always I say. Pain is real. We don't know why the pain, but it is real. So we just started in 2011 to find out some uh, basically cure, not just a maintenance drug, a cure for this pain. <clears throat> so I just, uh, uh, my title is Therapeutic Effect of Nisulfram. And uh, you see the uh, yeah, Borrelia, it's a real Borrelia, it's a GFP producing Borrelia. The amazing thing about this particular uh, uh, bacteria is it can drill through anywhere, everywhere, nothing can stop it. It got a mechanism to drill through. It's an extremely efficient way of moving through the uh, tissue. And, uh, and I, just to get an inspiration from Michelangelo's work, uh, David's statue, if you look at it, uh, if you study it very carefully, he's holding a yeah, bevel. Uh, it's a very, very high density bevel. Be uh, and then he is focusing on killing, um, you know, and the Golia, a giant. So when I was a graduate student uh, in Indian stuff technology, one day I saw a very nice uh, uh, writing in the notice board. Somebody wrote, many Israelites, they saw uh, Golia is too huge to even attack. And David saw he's too huge to miss. Because the problem is too huge, perhaps there is a solution. There is Maybe there exists a silver bullet. With this positive note, I start my uh, so uh, talk. Green button. Yeah, I did. <laughs> there you there. go. Yeah, so I just start with acknowledging people because without them, I don't think this uh, talk or even the discovery is possible. The first uh, uh, you know, uh, photograph is my group. It's about uh, 16 people, and uh, almost uh, six of them are totally engaged in uh, trying to understand the therapeutic effects and possibilities of therapeutic effects. And then I wanted to thank uh, uh, Dr. Ying Zhang because his kind of inspiration in 2014, uh, before we published our first paper, he published in 2014 a paper where he started the high throughput uh, idea for us. So we got kind of inspiration from him. And then I wanted to thank Dr. Kenneth Lehner, exceptionally uh, research oriented uh, clinician, a private practice. I mean, when he saw the therapeutic effect of disulfum, he started calling me almost every day, <laughs> every day. 30 minutes, he will try to have so much excited. Similar to my previous speaker, exceptionally passionate about treating patients and developing therapy. I really, really want my children to be like them. So the next one is uh, uh, Monica Embers. Monica Embers is again uh, my collaborator, especially developing animal model. And uh, this role, the organization, uh, at one point they were, they funded, they started funding me uh, that is Bay Area Lime Foundation and Live Lime Foundation, LK Whittier Foundation, Laurel Stem Foundation. And the, these are all the another four individuals I especially I wanted to thank. Uh, Chris Newby, uh, she uh, is from Stanford, my colleague, uh, all the time supportive of uh, us actually. So in fact, she wrote a nice uh, report in, our, in her uh, regular uh, uh, kind of magazine and that really helped me a lot. I forwarded that to all my supervisors. And then Christina Barr, and she is here. In fact, she is wearing the Dysel from for Lime t-shirt. Thank you, Christina. 
and uh, Cosette. She, she is a pharmacologist like me. <laughs> and then she is also very, very supportive. She used to travel almost 300 miles, I think, to come and, <laughs> come and then visit us and then encourage us. And then Harrison, so another like a, a patient advocate, he is also very, very helpful. So with that, I just uh, proceed with uh, my, our, uh, Yeah, these are all the two individuals made a very, very uh, important uh, ish, uh, work. I think they did, they did a very good, uh, you know, <coughs> contributions in that. So I just specifically want to thank them. Yes, so uh, I just wanted to start with this. Things sometimes become very, very simple. So this is uh, Dr. Sir. Uh, Juan Robert is an FRS, is an English pharmacologist who just decided to study a age old, 3500 years old scientific idea. Not many people will do. It's an aspirin, you know, it's a people you know this use. They used to take it from willow bark and then use it. Everybody knows about it. Many missionaries, clergymen, they just used this technology to help people, pain reliever. But this person decided to dedicate his life to understand how exactly it works. Why? Because not only, you know, it, it will likely to be a big pharmaceutical success, great pain reliever, with that understanding of one molecule, a class of molecule we can discover. That was his aim and focus. And he, indeed, he succeeded in that. He found out the mechanism of aspirin. He successfully, you know, uh, made it possible mm -hmm. for everybody to get their, yeah. of course, they made a big it's money out of it, but he made a chatter, you know, it's a possible, the tablets of aspirin are possible. And subsequently, almost about 20 painkillers, different mechanism and a different class of action happened because of these things wonderful discovery by this one individual. I personally think with whatever the, you know, the bay and the, uh, anecdotal evidence we have with the diesel from, we really think we are coming closer to something similar to aspirin. Yeah, so this is, uh, uh, everybody know, like 10 to 20% of the patients. I really don't know why this number, all these 10 to 20%, um, but as a clinician need to explain this, but 10 to 20% of the patients always develop a chronic condition, a chronic painful condition. Uh, all of you learn a lot about it. So, do we have any kind of uh, a tissue or an organ that and uh, uh, you know that uh, that is almost like a uh, you know a reservoir, an organ reservoir for propagation of life. We found out from our study, and of course Monica Embers also agrees. Maybe the heart is the reservoir, you know, in a chronic condition where it always keeps the borrelia, and the borrelia is very very Ooh. comfortable in heart. After one point, you know, Adrian was talking about the acute effect. After one point, you don't see much difference when they live very happily in the heart and it goes to all the organs, through the bloodstream, brain, joints and skin, many places and cause this terrible disease. So, uh, how it is doing, I mean, uh, there are, this is, uh, we, we just wanted to find out the, uh, the brain, the, especially the cognition effect of the borrelial product in the brain. So, in fact, in the early this year, our paper got published in Journal of Neuroscience and got into a cover page. Why it went to the cover page? When we injected the borrelial product, yeah, you know, the fragment of borrelia inside the brain, the effect what we saw in the neurons, the synaptic function, everything is so dramatic. Again, the brain for whatever people say, it is real. It appears it's very, very real. We can measure the signals. We can measure the pain kind of signaling, cognition problem, uh, you know, people are undergoing. So we did this work and I, I'm going to show some quick slides of what are the uh, 
uh, work we did. So this is, uh, you know, we collaborate with uh, Dr. Joseph Hula. This is Nail Shai. Nail Shai developed this molecule. These are all the human iPS derived uh, cardiac uh, cells. So we kind of making a mini heart, a heart and a chip. And then we treat with uh, Borrelia to the cardiac cell and then try to find out whether we can we see any kind of inflammation in the cardiomyocytes. Of course, the answer is yes. Uh, as I mentioned to you, Borrelia products, Borrelia, when it moves through, it always shell out its outer core as a small uh, lipid with the protein, inflammatory proteins, and also some DNA part. It always just, uh, you know, shell out a lot of proteins around it. Wherever it goes, it just always sheets like in the snake, just move through the tissue. So in this case, what we found out, it is very inflammatory. What it means? It means it's going to, uh, not only it's going to make the heart in a, a, a different form, in a different phenotype. That means highly inflammatory. That's what it is doing. So this is what we found. Why this particular uh, uh, method is very, very important for us? Because whatever the drug we wanted to use it, we wanted to check whether that is going to cause any kind of problem. This, uh, this human tissue, the miniature tissue, because this is going to tell us whether it's going to have a very huge, huge toxicity or not. We prime it with the Borrelia first to make it a phenotype so that it is sensitized. Then we treat it with the different uh, uh, drug uh, molecules to ensure the heart is safe. It's, you know, for everything, the heart needs to be very, very safe for any therapy that many people are already aware. I need not elaborate that. So this is Kwon Min Kim. Kwon Min Kim developed in, like in the way, now she's developed a heart chip. Kwon Min Kim developed a brain chip. So he, what he is, his area of research, especially in Lyme is, he's making a small brain chip. He grew neurons and we, he also grew, he put the microglia in it. He put a different cells in it and try to see, try to infect with the Borrelia and try to find out how the signaling happened. In fact, all the work, most of the work, like 50% of the work in the general neuroscience work, it is all his work. You can see that the outer coat air is kind of lipidated peptide forms a small aggregates and we find that this aggregate stays forever. Of course, uh, John Alcott also showed the Borrelial protein uh, aggregates, they survive for very long time, years in the serum. What they did is they centrifuged it and then if by mass spec they characterized, they survive. That means not only Borrelia, Borrelia sometimes it need not be there in the body to have a disease. The particle it generated, it can survive and circulate for very, very, very long time and cause the uh, disease and also they can cause the inflammation. But we call it as a perpetual inflammation. So again, these are all the work. Uh, we just to take the animal brain and then we inject these particles on the brain. We try to show how a, you know different signaling changes. And again, this is uh, electrophysiology. We do on the chip. We find out profound changes in the elect in electrical signaling when you treat the neurons with the Borrelial products. And the same thing again. And we also did the PET scanning and we check how the hypoperfusion is happening in the brain when the borrelial products are treated with this brain. Of course, these are all the uh, uh, published data. I will skip these slides and I will go back to the efficacy of that. We also checked the efficacy in animal model. Uh, I, just, uh, I just wanted to ensure that we do work in animals a lot. Uh, in fact, yesterday, John Alcott, when he was mentioning about our work, he told it's only on test tube. It is not on just a test tube. Thank we you. have an animal model. We have a transgenic animal. We just check it. We, we, we do the screening on the test tube. 
we check whether it, we have a persistent model in in vitro and then we check the efficacy of the, uh, the drug and then we take it to the next stage, we take it to an animal model, we study the pharmacology, we study the efficacy in the animal model, we see whether the, we, the, the drugs can remove totally sterilize the bacteria in animal model. We <laughs> never stop at this stage. We also uh, take this one and then you know use it for the human IPS derived stem cells and then we check the efficacy of this drug formulation there. We do from the beginning to the end and we never do and we just started the clinical trial. We just initiated the clinical trial. We are getting ready with the protocol submission. We never do the uh, human trial. But in that case, we always go look for very carefully the Facebook postings, what <laughs> Christina is doing. We get a kind of free data, even though the data is an anecdotal data. So we carefully watch because after we publish, people are so desperate in this area. They start to go to the clinician, ask them to prescribe that one. That exactly happened in anti-abuse. People started asking the clinician, Almost thousands of people are hand abuse now with, uh, with people are having this chronic condition. And then, you know, Christina started their uh, website and then they all post their experience. Every day I spend hours in trying to see what's <laughs> happening. Yeah, that's thank you very much again for all the people who are bold enough to write both positive and negative effect of this amazing plan. So we just, uh, this is our protocol and this is all we do. We after the injection to this animal model, these animal models, they develop a chronic disease uh, when they are infected with Borrelia. So we just uh, take a heart, we take a spleen, we take a serum and then we do a multiplex analysis. This is what we found that at one point, uh, uh, you know, we just check how inflammatory they are. You can see some of the IL-1 beta, it is increased and the IL-10, interestingly, that is also increased. And surprisingly, we found IL-6 at this point in these animals, it is slow. So then again, this one is the, the brain, uh, we just treat the Borrelia with the neurons on the chip and try to find out what are the uh, proteins that is upregulated. Interestingly, what we found out is you can see this aldehyde, one of the, these are all the class of aldehyde dehydrogenases in our body. Uh, of course, not everybody knows about this. We are not designed to consume so much alcohol, but we still, it's a toxin, uh, like any other toxin, but alcohol, uh, we have a tremendous ability to metabolize them. 19 types of different aldehyde dehydrogenases we have and they just to detoxify whatever we have in our body. Interestingly, what we found out, when the Borrelia move through the tissue, either the brain or in the heart and in other organs, some by unknown mechanism, it increases this aldehyde dehydrogenases to pathological level, three times, four times. We don't know why. Now, after that, you know, uh, we studied, we found out the signaling mechanism, exactly how it is aldehyde dehydrogenase as Borrelia is increasing. It's exactly in the way cancer cells are increasing aldehyde dehydrogenases. Cancer cells are also increasing aldehyde dehydrogenases. In fact, some of the breast cancer, many type of cancer, they, they saw that aldehyde dehydrogenases is highly upregulated. Then later we discovered this aldehyde dehydrogenases, not only they detoxify, at one point they become a toxin. In fact, they become a pathological protein. So, yeah, you know, these proteins are upregulated to detoxify alcohol, aldehyde, aldehyde that is generated because of alcohol consumptions and some of the alcohol present in our body. At one point when they are very high level that happens in cancer cells, they, thems, they themselves become source of toxin. Yet, yet detoxifying enzyme become <laughs> a source of toxicity, especially in, that's what we found out in Borrelia infection, a chronic infection. So that perfect, the best mechanistic opportunity for diselbrum 
because disulfuram inhibit all the aldehyde dehydrogenases almost perfectly so when we checked it in this animal we also saw disulfuram by treatment disulfuram you infect the animals with borrelia you treat with the disulfuram you can reverse all the upregulation of aldehyde dehydrogenases in them Uh, so this is why what why what happens when you have lot of aldehyde dehydrogenases in high level. So you know this shows that when you have lot of aldehyde dehydrogenases, you always have lot of acetate in the nucleus. When you have a lot of acetate in nucleus, it get into a epigenic transition. That means you were the um, You in the, the DNA, some of the proteins are acylated, highly acylated. When it is highly acylated, we call it as epigenic uh, transition. That it leads to a different way of uh, protein and signaling expression. This one is kind of chronic effect. That means if a person is having high level of aldehyde dehydrogenases, there is a possibility they. it leads to an epigenic transition in the brain so they are sensitized for some of the pain process for very long time so that's what we call it as a perpetual inflammation it's a possible to reverse the condition only if you inhibit all this pathological enzyme we think that is what disulfuram is doing yeah so then come back to the persisters so so far we just to mention what happens in a chronic condition what happens in a chronic condition either a borrelia or borrelia products they can upregulate some of the aldehyde dehydrogenases to the pathological level when the aldehyde dehydrogenases in pathological level we also saw it can leads to an epigenic transitions in the nucleus leads to a yeah, aberrant uh, uh, signaling process ultimately linked to the inflammation and pain we have a lot of data to show it is uh, linked to the nf kappa b pathway and perpetual inflammation it can trigger all the time something similar to type 2 diabetes a chronic painful condition without even any kind of presence of any pathological uh, species in the body so the next one what we found out in case Uh, of course monica embers very very clearly showed there is a you know even after doxycycline treatment in a, in a primate model you see lot of borrelia persisting borrelia is there lot of data is there but in spite of that we don't have a human data to show after an antibiotic treatment borrelia is persisting we don't know that yet that's why cdc is having a, a you know they took a stand that maybe persister is not the reason for the disease so but we took that uh, particular stand okay uh, again it's my own uh, view it is not my institute my university view so what if there is a persister still persister is there and then it causing disease so when we develop a therapeutic agent we will develop one bullet one molecule needs to address the inflammation perpetual inflammation either by the presence of the borrelia or by the borrelial borrelial product is it possible yes it is possible like similar to hitting the golia with one bubble of course golia was carrying lot of effects but we david was having only one bubble and we did that and then then we went to the persistent model so persister i am reintroducing again borrelia is not thank god it is not having the mechanism to change it you know it's not developing a resistance like a tb and other organism it's a good thing it's dumb enough not to have that but smart enough to develop a drug tolerance it shut down everything it leads to a low metabolic state the moment it sends doxycycline So Kim Lewis and other people they showed in dish in tube that this organism develop into in fact in my lab we are growing we just treat them with the doxycycline uh, uh, this borrelia because it's just a bacteriostatic then we take the residual bacteria and then we grow them again to show that means this this bacteria literally it is kind of maintained in doxycycline 
<laughs> so we take this bad word and say, these are all we call it, persistent. So persistent, pain is real, persistence is also real, at least in fish and animals, in primates. So we take this persistent, you can see when you have one of them, you know, the red thing, that is kind of developed, kind of, uh, you know, resistance to or tolerance, we can call it as a tolerance. No change in the genomic material. Tolerance for the, that means it can live. Even we have a lot of doxycycline around them. So then we take that and then culture it again. It is culturable. They can come back. That's what people think that in human body, this persister can persist when there is a drug concentration, ineffective drug like doxycycline. And then when you remove the doxycycline, they come back. That's what people say, the persister mechanism. So we wanted to try something that can totally kill the persistent. Uh, so we did that. So all the drug screening we did, we did a very extensive drug screening, yeah, high throughput drug screening. This is how it takes. You just start with a lot of molecules. In our case, more than 6,000 molecules. Majority of them are FDA approved. And then we check, we grow the persister in the dish and then we try to screen them. So this is the mechanism, you know, they, this a molecule, sensitive molecule can detect the presence of Borrelia. So we have a, a plated, like, you know, we, we buy at Stanford, we buy a plates or a, a kind, a kind of tubes, test tubes, coated with 6,000 different molecules, drugs, already pre-coated. Then we take a Borrelia, we culture all the, you know, we have a robotics to do that. We culture the Borrelia on them and then using this technology, we check whether they are alive or not. We make them to grow for 48 hours and maintain them in the presence of those 6,000 molecules. And then we check whether if they have, you know, how do you know that the person is alive or not, the way they breathe, we check whether they breathe. <laughs> How do we know the Borrelia is alive or not? We check whether they have the ATP release, a burst of air. So what, how we do? We do a similar technology, this luciferin, you know, the firefly, fly, they just emit light. The same technology we copy. We may put, the, we take this uh, firefly enzyme, it's called luciferase. And then this, we design this luciferase in a way, when they sense the ATP, they release the luciferin. So that signal we measure very accurately. In a dish, we can even, uh, you know, like 10 Borrelia, if it is there alive, we can find out. Very, very accurate method. So we use this technology and then uh, we found out, hey, these are all our robotic system. Uh, ah. We found out these top 20 molecules. This is our 2016 paper. That's awesome. So if you see, we put, uh, I don't know why uh, Ravindra Potanini, who is the first author, he decided to put disulfiram as the first molecule. Um, he put that molecule first when he, he wrote the paper. This is the molecule, so simple, as simple as aspirin, as I mentioned. And then the last one is azulosilin. For Ravi, azulosilin is always very favorite molecule. For the reason you're, I'm going to tell you now. Uh, so the reason for that, azulosilin is the least side effects molecule. It's very, very great molecule. It's a, a traditional antibody. But I like the disulfiram. Why? It is having a lot of side effects, but at the same time, it is not a traditional antibiotic. Why Tra traditional antibiotic? is better, not a traditional antibiotic qualified a good drug candidates in Borrelia because when you treat patients, you are not going to destroy the microbiome, good bacteria. But if you take other antibiotic, whatever the great antibiotic you have, you always destroy the microbiome. Microbiome is very, very important. Maybe all of you are aware at this time. Why? In the when the, when the kid or a child, it needs breastfeeding because it supports the microbiome. Very, very important. After 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, people develop disease because if their microbiome is not properly maintained. 
So that means if your person is undergoing a treatment, you are developing some therapeutic agent without affecting microbiome. That would be wonderful, in spite of the fact that it is likely to have some side effect. So I was promoting that and he was promoting azelaslin, but both we decided we will develop both of them. One is for acute, one is for chronic condition. So, but disulfiram, as Ravi pointed out, it's a dangerous molecule. Why? Because you see this, uh, I took it from the bed. Uh, you see an alcohol bottle. Before developing it, I never know. You cannot separate anybody without alcohol. It's surprising that we live, it's not, people need not take every day few pegs of alcohol. We are literally our civilization is filled with alcohol product and this drug even if somebody smells alcohol will make them cry, make them sick for days, sick for days. That's the danger. That is the downside of this particular drug. In fact, uh, almost two years ago I mentioned this disulfur effect to one of my friends and then uh, she's, she was, she is having a chronic Lyme disease and she was very, very upset with me. <laughs> she told I will never take anything that will be anti-abuse. <laughs> I will never, I'd rather to live with chronic Lyme with my alcohol as my friend. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> Not, I, even if it is a cure, I don't want, there are people like that. So, then I, I thought I, I thought it is very strange. You know, I am from originally India. Alcohol is not a very big problem for us. Many of us, I never took alcohol, uh, you know, before coming to the United States. Uh, because it, that's what we are right. No alcohol, zero alcohol. But uh, in Europe, in France, when I went to France, I found out you can't eat food without alcohol. Uh, so they, 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 there is no no uh, culture in France without alcohol. They drink alcohol. I first day I went there, I wanted to drink water. Then I told in the library, I want water. Oh, in France we don't drink water. We drink wine. <laughs> so I thought it's a very very strange for me. But but even in United States, they still carry that. Everywhere we have alcoholic products, not only uh, e eatables, even you go to hospital, you have a small little alcoholic thing for sanitizing, disulfiram will make you to cry in the hospital itself <laughs> within two hours. That's true. Then they do. And you smell it? Oh, good smell. Chinese restaurant, all of the Chinese products are fermented sauce they use. You take the Chinese food, you take the anti abuse, that's it. For a people with a perpetual inflammation like Lyme, this is 10 times they are more sensitive for alcohol, uh, for anti-abuse. Let us say that normal person who is having an abusive behavior, they are taking 500 milligrams or sorry, 250 milligrams a day. They are fine. No side effects if they are very careful in not going towards alcohol. For a chronic Lyme patients, we found out, of course, all of them are anecdotal evidence based on the Facebook uh, <laughs> posting. What we found out, they have almost 10 times more sensitivity for alcohol if they are on disulfiram. That's why developing this therapy is so difficult and sometimes so dangerous because of unpleasant side effects. So this is uh, uh, the azelocelin, you know, you can see when you are titrating the uh, concentration of the drug, azelocelin literally kills the bacteria, totally sterilizes the bacteria in the dish. We don't, we just take that and then grow them, we never, uh, these bacteria never come back, that means they are gone forever. So that we call it as, and again here, our, uh, you, you know, the mitomycin, when originally King Louis did this, he found out some of the cancer uh, reagents also killing uh, the Borrelia with all the persistence, but you can't develop mitomycin, you know, it's a very toxic drug. 
So then, to our surprise, we found out Azulosalin is cleaning up the Borrelia very effectively, literally zero Borrelia. Then here comes uh, our hero, <laughs> Diselfrom also, like Doxyribicin. Again, Doxyribicin is a very toxic cancer drug. It is not as good as Doxyribicin in Epirubicin, but it is okay. It is much, much better. It is clearing all the uh, persisters. And then again, you know, we, we did several times. We, you know, when we did this, we couldn't even believe that this drug is so effectively killing uh, Borrelia. Then we took, we compared it with a lot of therapeutic agents. You know, you can see, it's all, we call it, I mean, you always read BioADD team as a Stanford BioADD team. It's all generated from our screen. We did all the work. We did with all the persistence the effect. We also did with an animal, we also took them to the other kind of uh, model, cell culture model and uh, you know, other animal models we have. We tried to find out how effectively they work. It's almost very tedious, five to six years work, what you see here. And this is the animal model we use. It's a transgenic model. Many of the mice, they are all reservoirs. They don't develop disease. But this particular animal, we people observe, they develop a disease, they develop a heart condition, they develop a arthritis, they develop neurological problem as humans do when they are exposed to this Borrelia infection. So this is what we did and you can see that how we checked the animal model. You know, uh, this experiments we repeated several times. This is a kind of representative of all our experiment. We tried, with, we checked with the minocycline, doxycycline, you know, the DSF is a disulfiram and with the bigger, different drug formulation also we tried azulocelin and we, all, we can, with the PCR evidence we have to show a oral disulfiram is very effectively sterilizing in animals also. Yeah, so this is, uh, uh, again this was verified by Kim Lewis. This is the uh, figure and it, this particular video made uh, so famous uh, basically. So I'm going to uh, skip and these are all the two individuals who developed this. They observed that uh, the people working in a rubber factory, you know, vulcanizing rubber, always in the weekend, if they, those days they try to mix it without using gloves and then when they are exposed to this drug, these uh, people, they always reported that they when they got the weekend boost, they were feeling awful. So they reported it. So like in a proper reporting, always develop a good therapy, like what happened in Viagra, it happened in Dysulfram too. And uh, you know, but um, as I mentioned, I always put this, when you know, Samson, you know, the Samson and Delilah, when he was, uh, when the, his parents were promised of the child, a redeemer for Israelites, they were warned, stay away from ethyl alcohol, wine, anything related to <laughs> That's So I, when I read that, I was surprised. Why? Why? Anything related to me. Whether it's such an important thing, yes, it is very, very important, especially for anti-obvious therapy. So uh, these are all the mechanistic thing how it exactly happens so I'm going to skip all this so in our case pro drug is a drug for an anti-abuse metabolite is drug mm -hmm. in our case pro drug is a drug why this information is important this information is important because we need to reformulate for a better sterilization of Borrelia that is what we achieve so whatever the uh, formulation we are promoting now it is not what you see in an anti-abuse it's likely to given to people in another one or two years because we are currently doing a clinical trial. So this is the aldehyde dehydrogenase and this is the uh, uh, inflammatory pathway where disulfiram specifically inhibiting nf kappa B pathway. So that it, this is sorry for this slide. When, when Borrelia is exposed and it by a part one mechanism, you can see one particular uh, 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 transcription factor 
is highly upregulated. When this transcription factor binds to the nuclear uh, nuclear material, it always they have lot of messenger RNA of aldehyde, lot of aldehyde dehydrogenases, highly upregulated. This exactly happens in cancer. That is why inflammation is promoting cancer. And the same thing happens in um, borreal uh, infection. Also, you have plenty of these aldehyde dehydrogenases. Basically, they are pathological. And uh, yeah. so this is the reversal we saw by treating with the disulfiram, we can literally downregulate this protein, pathological protein. Then, you know, this is, we call it as an epigenic uh, transition, borreal exposure, pushes the cells to this and then disulfiram likely to reverse it. We have an early evidence to show we can even change us the signaling that is going on, perpetual signaling that is going on in the brain and in other organs. And again, finally, I want to go back to uh, your final comments. So this is just an early observation. Uh, of course, uh, all my, whatever I told, need not be taken as a clinical effects. Only your clinician need to tell you whether you can take auto abuse or any other drug for whatever the disease condition you are in. So please don't take whatever the message you got or learning you got, don't translate into your clinical advice. So uh, there is a promise, there is a possibility. I think aspirin, like an aspirin, disulfiram may be a kind of therapeutic opportunity to, for the treatment of chronic life. Thanks again for it. Dr. Rajas, please help me welcome Dr. Kristen Honey to the stage.